we burn out not because of the challenge, but because of the disconnection between the challenge and its original purpose. Imagine that you were on a journey and you've been walking this journey for a long time, step after step after step. And imagine I come over to you and ask you, how's it going on this journey? Now, typically you'd probably answer me based on things like how the path is, you know, if the path is easy, if there's beautiful views, if there's a, you know, a clear way to walk, you might say that the, the journey is going pretty well. And if the path was difficult, if it was, you know, very strenuous, or if you were constantly, uh, you know, arriving at obstacles or, or problems, you'd probably say the path is not very good. It's not going very well. So imagine I came now and I give you a compass and you remember that that compass was the original reason why you started this journey. In fact, you wanted to head west. And as you look up and you look back at your compass, you see that you've been heading east. Now, when you answer the question of how's it been going, you might have a completely different answer, not based on your experience of the journey, but rather based on the orientation of the compass and which way you've been walking. So herein lies the third factor, the third thing keeping us stuck doing stuff that we don't wanna do, that we lose the fundamental why that got us started on this journey. So you can probably relate to the fact that a lot of things that you start doing have a clear why in mind. Like for example, you might start studying a course with an intention to learn or to grow. You might kind of decide to exercise more regularly um, with the intention to be more healthy and care for your body. There is initially a compass that sets us on the path. And over time, often what happens to that why is it starts to dissolve in the face of adversity, of difficult emotions, of unhelpful thoughts. And eventually the why almost seems to have completely become invisible. At that point, it would be great if behavior stopped. However, the issue is that it doesn't stop. And what kicks in is the default principle we talked about last week, the orientation to pursue what feels best and the orientation to avoid what feels worst. So when the original reason why we started doing something has almost become forgotten, our behavior keeps moving and it's not being driven by that why anymore. It's being driven by the default compass, I'll call it. The default compass is what we talked about last week. Let's take an example to make this to make, this make sense. Let's say that you want to cut out sugar. And initially, you've watched one of those films like that sugar film or sugar blues, you've read the book or something where you've just really been enlightened by how harmful this product is to your body. So you decide to cut out sugar with a real connection and insight as to why you want to do this. However, over time, the uncomfortable urges, you know, the thoughts that your mind says like it's not that bad or I can just have one and it will be okay. These things remain prevalent as time passes and our connection with that original why diminishes. The default setting to pursue pleasure and to avoid discomfort increases in its capacity to influence our decisions and eventually we might find ourselves back at Coles buying the chocolate bar or back drinking a can of Coke or whatever it is and wondering how we got here. So today we're talking about a very simple principle that if you're going to do something hard, you have to be closely connected with a reason to do it. Take this metaphor for example. Life is kind of like a boardroom meeting where you sit at the chair of the board and you decide what's actually going to happen. In this boardroom meeting, there are two characters. On your right is someone who has been here for a very long time. They have been here since the start of this business and they have helped you to make a lot of decisions that have protected you from going bankrupt or protected you from any issues that might have happened if you didn't listen to them. Now, this particular character has a personality that's quite verbose, very intrusive, and they tend to just say whatever they think as it comes up. Very loud character we have over here. On the other side, we have the opposite personality. A person who's also been there for the entire time, yet this particular person has a different personality. They don't speak up without you asking them a question. They don't intrude into your conversations with the other person. And sometimes you might even go through whole meetings without actually asking this person what they think. And herein is the reality of life. On the right, we have our mind. On the left, we have our values. The two are so different in how they act. If we're not 
consciously and intentionally trying to keep a connection with the why of what we're doing, the mind and us become engaged in this bi-directional influence and advising. And as we said in week two, the mind is geared towards the pursuit of what feels good, the avoidance of what feels bad. So if our values are pulling us to do something that actually is important, yet might be uncomfortable to pursue, without a consistent connection with those values, we're eventually going to fade into a bi-directional conversation with our mind and its principle for pleasure seeking and pain avoidance. I want to talk about three common issues within this area of being disconnected from our fundamental why, from our compass. The first of these issues is that sometimes we just don't really know what we value. The default setting to pursue what feels good to avoid what feels bad has been active in our lives for so long that we actually didn't know there was another way to be. This can happen for very understandable reasons. Sometimes life can be so tumultuous. There can be so many difficult circumstances that we've faced, maybe even early in our life, in our childhood, that living well has become equivalent to simply avoiding pain. It just kind of imagine it this way, that if you were on fire and someone asked you what you really would like, simply not being on fire would probably be sufficient for what your mind can conceive of at that time. So this is point number one, just to glaze over it, is that we don't know what we actually value. The second common issue that can happen in this scope of disconnection from our fundamental why is that we can transform values into rules, transform things that we want to pursue freely into things that we got to make sure we don't break or things that we should be doing. Sometimes we take on values from our outside world and absorb them as rules that we need to maintain. It's hard to tell the difference between a value and a rule sometimes. So here's a really quick exercise that you can do to kind of give you a sense of this. Just close your eyes for a moment and just imagine yourself doing something that you really enjoy. Imagine that you had the rest of the day or tomorrow off and, and, you, wouldn't, and, and you could have the whole time to freely do something that you want to be doing. Just notice what that feels like to imagine the freedom to pursue that activity, whatever it is. Maybe it's fishing or being at the beach. Maybe it's reading a book on your lounge. Maybe it's just going out for a meal. Whatever it is, just imagine the freedom to do that behavior and notice what it feels like to imagine that right now. Now, I want you to imagine doing the same thing, but I want you to add the image of someone else. Maybe it's some sort of authority figure that you can imagine, maybe a boss or a police officer or someone who's kind of standing over you watching you do this activity, kind of like with a clipboard and pen, sort of watching you, kind of making sure that you're using your time well, making sure that you're not wasting time, kind of, you know, judging you, like evaluating how well you're doing, all these things. Notice when you add that image, notice the shift in the experience. The activity stays the same, the behavior stays the same, but the experience of it and how it's being pursued completely shifts. In that exercise is the experience of what it's like to pursue a value and what it's like to follow a rule. If I can quote Steve Hayes again, one of the founders of acceptance and commitment therapy, he says that values are held lightly but pursued passionately, whereas rules are held tightly and pursued compulsorily. The third common issue that can take place in this area that we're talking about is that we can start to prioritize furnishings over foundations. In your house, you might have some really nice pieces of furniture or things that you've put up. Maybe there's photos on the wall or a fridge, a couch that you really like or a seat that you like to sit in. These things are certainly very nice things to have in a house. However, if we took away the walls, the roof, the foundation, and all the structural components of the house, you see that the utility of those furnishings is largely lost without those structural components. So in the same way, I would say that we as human beings have these fundamental or foundational values, things that kind of keep us up, things that are important to us, our core values, you call them. And then we have these other values, these secondary values, things that are also important, but lose their flavor and vitality in the absence of the fundamental values. For example, I might really value adventure. However, if I don't have other values that I'm connected to in my life, like a sense of connection, belonging, or even stability, 
then adventure is actually not something that I feel ready to approach or move towards unless those things are in place. So whether you don't know what you value, whether your values are being pursued by rules, or whether you're pursuing furnishing values like foundations, whichever the case, the fundamental issue is we burn out not because of the challenge, but because of the disconnection between the challenge and its original purpose. So next week, we're going to talk about the fourth and final thing that keeps us stuck doing stuff that we don't want to do. And the next month is where I want to introduce the things we can do to actually address each of these four problems, each of these four factors keeping us stuck.